you're here tonight to celebrate the Dodgers, and particularly the Dodgers' move to L.A., which has been chronicled so well by Andy McHugh, our first speaker for tonight. Andy is the uh, former president of the Society of American Baseball Research. He's a former journalist. He's a former Whittierite. So we welcome Andy back to Whittier for the presentation tonight. Following Andy's presentation, we will have time for a few questions before we move to a presentation by Wes Parker, who has previously been on the Whittier College campus. He played for the Claremont Colleges when he was an undergraduate and played here at the Whittier College field uh, in the late 1950s and remembers one of Whittier's star pitchers, Steve Jones, who had a fastball that moved uh, with amazing alacrity. But I must have a twist to introduce also Wes Parker because my sons, never Dodger fans until we moved here, became Dodger fans when Wes signed a baseball for them out at the Whitwood Mall <laughs> shortly after we moved to Whittier in the early 1980s. So uh, Wes, it's still visible. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, with that, let's kick off, or at least bring to the plate, the leadoff hitter tonight, Andy McHugh. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming. Thank you to Joe and Terry. Terry, are you here finally now? No, unfortunately. Uh, and the uh, both people at the Institute here and Terry's baseball reliquary. It'd be very interesting to uh, speak to you all tonight and talk to you about the Dodgers moving here. I'm going to talk about the rather mixed reception that the Dodgers got uh, when they first came here, and I'm going to discuss a rather um, symbolic and important photograph uh, from the uh, evolution of the Dodgers in Los Angeles. They say a, a photograph is worth a thousand words. But some of them, I think, are worth less than a thousand words and need a couple of thousand words of context uh, to have them make sense. So with that, let's turn to 1957. Uh, boy, too fast. OK. In 1957, top-level professional sports in Los Angeles consisted of the Los Angeles Rams. If you all recognize Joe Marconi there going around the left hand. Uh, they played six games in Los Angeles that year. That was the extent of top-level professional sports in Los Angeles. And the city fathers, all the, the uh, establishment downtown, felt that Los Angeles should definitely have more than that. Um, you can see here, this is the top 10 cities in population in the United States at various census points. Um, and you can see that Los Angeles is steadily moving up the charts and still, at least as of 1950, having no uh, professional baseball team. The numbers in parentheses are the number of uh, major league franchises in each city. Um, and the city, as I said, was very interested in uh, attracting major league baseball and, and other uh, similar uh, methods of entertainment. Um, since 1932, the Junior Chamber of Commerce's major product project had been to attract major league baseball to Los Angeles. And uh, eventually, in 1957, uh, they were able to do so. Um, as you can see the date on this, this is about two weeks after the Los Angeles City Council signed a contract with the Dodgers to bring them here. And let me give you the basics of, of the contract. The city was to provide the Dodgers with approximately 300 acres up in Chavez Ravine and spend a couple of million dollars on streets and freeway connections to hook up the stadium with the, the new street pattern that would be created by the construction of the stadium. In return, the city was to receive the site of Wrigley Field, uh, which the Dodgers owned because they owned the Los Angeles Angels of the Pacific Coast League. And this was in an area uh, just kind of a little bit southeast of downtown at the corner of 26th and Avalon in an area uh, that was uh, rather crowded, uh, becoming heavily African American and had no parks. And the city wanted to build a park there, which they eventually did, and it's a, a park there to this day. Um, in addition, the Dodgers promised they would build some recreational facilities on the 300 acres up in Chavez Ravine. And most importantly, really from the city's point of view, 
They promised they would definitely go ahead and build a modern baseball stadium that would seat at least 50,000 people, which would fit the image needs of the city, according to the, uh, to the downtown people, um, but would also uh, pay property taxes. Uh, it was more common then, but now I believe there are only two major league stadiums that pay property taxes because they're private property. Everything else is owned by a city or a city county or some kind of metropolitan taxing district. Um, so the, the city was getting certain benefits uh, out of it. Now this is, to really grasp, I think today, it's kind of hard to grasp what this meant to the city. We just assume all this stuff 60 years later, okay? But here the Dodger plane lands. You can see Los Angeles Dodgers has been painted on the side of the plane already, even though only it's two weeks in, into their history. But there are over a thousand people out at LAX uh, to meet the plane. On the right, you can see uh, uh, County Supervisor uh, Ernest Hahn and City Councilwoman uh, Rosalind Wyman greeting O'Malley and presenting him with a uh, some kind of a scroll welcoming him to Los Angeles. And then at the bottom, there's a little picture showing Wyman and O'Malley. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, behind a bunch of microphones and uh, uh, pressing the flesh. There were a lot of uh, people there. One of the people there was uh, John Ferraro, who was a city councilman and had been in, uh, an offensive lineman at SC just a few years before. And the crowd was so packed, Ferraro couldn't force his way through to get up to the dais to, uh, so he could be on, on TV. And people were just incredibly excited. Let, let me read you a little quote from, from Vincent Flaherty, who was the major sports columnist for the Hearst Papers in Los Angeles at the time. He said, the coming of the Dodgers is the pink diffused dawning of a splendid new era for Los Angeles. There was a lot of pink diffused prose being thrown around at the time. People were just uh, so excited and glad that, that they were becoming a major league city. Um, five days later, there's a luncheon, which even more shows just how agog the city was. You can see Welcome Dodgers it's harder to read that, that banner below that, which says the greatest catch in baseball with uh, Los Angeles represented by a mitt catching the Dodgers. This event had been put together in five days. It sold out 1,100 seats in the Biltmore Hotel's main ballroom. Uh, the tickets had been six bucks, which was about twice what a box seat would cost, both at the Coliseum and at Dodger Stadium. But the tickets had all been snapped up in less than two days. And all of these people are crowded into the room. And to, to the sensibilities of this era, I think the most amazing thing to me is that two different Los Angeles television stations televised the lunch in its entire two hour, 20 minute length without any commercials. And you can imagine how interesting a program, you'd watch people eat lunch for two hours and 20 minutes. But, but people, I mean, they, they televised the program in a bit. There was also, you know, say a parade you may be able to tell that all the cars in the parade are Edsel's. Um, but uh, this was kind of deal. Uh, Councilwoman Wyman sat in a car. She was a native of Los Angeles. And she was just amazed at the parade. She said, this is the greatest parade LA has ever put on. It's all time. Sitting next to her is Sandy Koufax, who is a native of New York. And Koufax looks around and says, Boy, we have more people on the street on an average day than I see at this parade. So there was some kind of Temperate, the, the Los Angelinos are very, very enthusiastic as Wyman was. Others were uh, kind of putting a little uh, temperance into all of that. Um, this is an example of how the newspapers were kind of overflowing, a special section for the examiner for opening day. The Times headline on the morning of opening day in Los Angeles, and then a, a game story from a few days before with the historic significance of the first major league home run on the West Coast unfortunately hit by a giant against the Dodgers in San Francisco. But uh, people were, as I said, excited. And it translated. It wasn't just mouth enthusiasm. People actually came out. This is attendance from just after World War II until the year 2000. The red bar represents the break between Brooklyn and Los Angeles. You can see that in 1958, the first year, um, Attendance broke the all-time Brooklyn record, despite the team being really, really awful. Um, and the second year, when they won the World Series, attendance went up even further. And you can see that over time, uh, attendance has stayed very, very high. The Dodgers are 
consistently one of the best attendance uh, teams in the major leagues. I just this week noted they're averaging 47,000 something a year, uh, a night this year, uh, first in the majors, and the second is down around 41 or 42,000. So it's, they've been a consistent, very successful draw uh, over all the years. But let's go back. You'll recall this photo that I showed you earlier on at the scene at the airport. And now I'm going to show you a photo that was taken two seconds later. Okay? And here you've got the first signs of opposition. We want the bums, not the bum deal. Uh, a couple of seconds after this photo, a guy sticks his head in front of the microphone and says, Mr. O'Malley, welcome to Los Angeles. Here's a summons from the people of Chavez Ravine. And uh, O'Malley turns to Councilman Wyman and says, what is this? And she says, Walter, just keep walking. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> So this, this would go on for four years, actually for five years in some cases, as various <coughs> excuse me, elements in the city uh, tried to overturn the deal or modify the deal and make it more difficult uh, for the Dodgers uh, to build their stadium. Uh, the man behind this is Councilman John Holland. Uh, Councilman Holland uh, had been elected to the council in 1943. He represented uh, Highland Park, which is uh, kind of about halfway up the Pasadena Freeway to Pasadena uh, from downtown. Uh, he was very conservative, uh, very proud of that. Uh, when he retired in the mid-60s, he said he thought he'd fought three great battles uh, for uh, the city of Los Angeles and won two of them. Uh, the one that was in the past, just to give you an idea, was that he had successfully fought against the fluoridation of the city water system in Los Angeles, which was a huge issue with conservatives in the early 1950s. In this case, in the case of the Dodgers, which, as you have guessed, is one of the issues that he lost on, um, he put together or sponsored what was known as Proposition B. Proposition B was to go on the ballot in, in this coming June, June of 1958. And the, the referendum basically asked the voters, are you happy with this deal that the city council made with the Dodgers? And um, let's take a look at who supported this. This was the, the people who are interested, excuse me, in, in the image of Los Angeles. This was the core, and you can see this is this quote across the bottom is kind of the, the basis of all of their thinking. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, real estate, the law firms, the big newspapers, and movie stars. Now there's some movie stars, Joey Brown, Danny Kay, who were real sincere baseball fans, but there were a lot of movie stars who just wanted another excuse to get their, their picture taken and, and quoted in the newspaper or something else. So but these, these people had a vision of what you might all call a, an imperial Los Angeles, a Los Angeles whose, whose reputation, whose shadow matched the size of the population of the area. Um, the, the opponents, and there you can see kind of their slogan across the bottom now, um, would, would consistently say, well, we're not, we're not opposed to the Dodgers, we just don't like this particular deal. But some of them obviously had deeper things in mind. The movie theaters, who were already really under the impact of television, didn't want another kind of entertainment taking place every evening during the summer, which they would have to compete with. Uh, and then there were all of the uh, suburban areas. Let me show you this. Um, all of the colored areas are districts of the city of Los Angeles, which as you can see there, is a geographic mess and pretty much always has been. There's a couple of uh, Santa Monica there, Beverly Hills up there, San Fernando up there. There's a couple of uh, incorporated cities within an area. Around the edges there are unincorporated county areas and other cities. But this, I mean, LA extended all over. You've got the, you've got the downtown, you've got this huge area which in the 50s was growing very fast at the San Fernando Valley. You've got the harbor area, which is almost a world unto itself. And all of them had very distinctive uh, issues that they dealt with vis-a-vis uh, -vis downtown. Um, many people, of course, were fans, and they were probably going to uh, vote for baseball anyway. But there were also, in addition to being fans, many of them were residents, and they had as I said, issues. That spring was a very rainy spring in Los Angeles. And at one point, two-thirds of the schools in the San Fernando Valley 
had to be closed for a week because of flooding. This didn't happen in any other schools in the whole city of Los Angeles. And it happened because the city had been slow in completing the, the storm drain and runoff systems in the valley. And people knew that, and so out there, this was an issue that kind of <coughs> spoke to them as residents that the city was interested in spending money on uh, helping a team like the Dodgers come when they couldn't solve the kind of basic issues that the, that the city could be uh, dealing with. So, at first, O'Malley was not particularly worried uh, about this Proposition B. He thought they'd win easily. But as the, as the debate went on, as the issues were argued out, he became concerned. And on May 11th, the vote is to take place June 3rd. On May 11th, he announces that the Dodgers were going to televise all of their road games up in San Francisco. And before that, he had been saying that there would be no televising of Dodger games ever, no matter what. He felt that in Brooklyn, where they had televised a great number of their games, that it had been very deleterious to their attendance in Brooklyn, and he didn't want to repeat that. So he didn't want to televise. But now, all of a sudden, for Dodger Road games, they would be televised if they were in San Francisco. And that was certainly the policy for the next decade or so until TV kind of changed. Um, so as it became closer, finally, on June 1st, two days before the vote was to take place, KTTV Channel 11, which was owned by the Los Angeles Times at that point, donated five hours for what they called the Dodger Thon. And this was basically a five-hour commercial for people to vote yes on Proposition B. Uh, it was emceed by Joey Brown, the actor, whom you can see here in, in the picture on the left. Um, it featured a debate between Councilman uh, Holland and another councilman, and uh, Councilwoman Wyman and uh, Tom Harmon. Uh, Tom Harmon was a former Heisman Trophy winner who was now doing uh, radio and TV sports in Los Angeles. Uh, you students may recognize him as the father of Mark Harmon. Uh, but uh, he, was, he was a big celebrity in, in LA at the time. You can also see O'Malley came on, showed this artist rendering of what the stadium was going to look like. It actually didn't wind up looking like that, but that was the artist rendering at the time. And you can see the, the Proposition B logo in the back. Evidently, the Dodger Fund did its work because on Tuesday, the Dodgers got 52% uh, of the vote, and uh, the, uh, the city's contract was upheld for a day. Um, this is a fellow named Phil Silver. Uh, this is not Sergeant Bill Cook. Uh, he's a, he was a lawyer uh, in L.A. and uh, ideologically very attuned to John Pollard. And within a couple of days of the acceptance of Proposition B, Silver went out and filed a lawsuit uh, saying not, not the referendum had said to the voters, is this a good deal for the city? Silver's lawsuit says, is this legal? saying that provisions of the contract between the city were so totally favorable to the Dodgers that it wasn't a fair contract. And within six weeks, he got the Superior Court of Los Angeles to agree with him. Um, and that was kind of a, a stunning setback as far as the city and the Dodgers were concerned. And they quickly appealed it. And six months later, the Supreme Court said, well, yes, some of the provisions of the contract are very favorable to the Dodgers. But other provisions on the contract are very favorable to the city. And on balance, this is not an unreasonable deal for the city council to make. Um, the uh, Silver then appeals it to the US Supreme Court. And uh, nine months later, the Supreme Court says, we're not even going to listen to this. We're not going to hear it, which in effect turns it back to the decision of the state Supreme Court and ends it. But you will notice from that date, that it is almost exactly two years after he got off that plane at LAX that we showed earlier. So two years have been lost. Costs have gone up. All other kinds of, of trouble are there. And um, while the city had stood by him through all these lawsuits, the city was proving to be something less than an excellent partner. This is a picture of the stadium site. You can see that the stadium itself is almost done, but the parking lots have not been blacktopped. I want to show it to you for a couple of, of issues that, the, that the, the city is dealing with. First of all, they wanted a road. They wanted a road that ran from Chinatown across the parking lot into Elysian Park in 
and then down to the Golden State Freeway and out to the San Fernando Valley. The diner said, okay, we'll build you this, you know, two, two or four lane blacktop across the parking lot. The city said, no, 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 that's not good enough. It has to have curves and gutters. It has to be painted and it has to have stoplights and stop signs on it where they're appropriate. So the Dodgers had to go out and build that road, cost them $60,000, but because of the progress of construction, it was only up for 109 days and then had to be torn down, okay? Now you've also got another area of the stadium over here, kind of buried under the, uh, all the grading work on behind third base. There was a strip there of 11 lots, sorry, 12 lots. Uh, most of them houses, but one small store, okay? These were not part of the uh, parcel that the city already owned that it could trade to the Dodgers. It had to acquire these plots of lands in order to turn over the land, the amount of land that they had promised to the Dodgers. So, beginning in 1957, they started to move to get this land. And guess what? The people wanted more money. All of a sudden, their houses were worth more than they thought of them worth. They banded together, they hired a lawyer, they began to hold out and argue that they shouldn't pay just the assessed value, which is what the city wanted to pay them, but they should actually get what the property was worth in view of the Dodgers coming in. And the city balked at that, and the city then just sat on it and did nothing about it. And eventually, in 1960, construction has reached the point where they literally had to have those houses or construction would have had to stop. And at that point, O'Malley had to dig into his own pocket the houses in Toro had been assessed at just under $83,000. O'Malley wound up paying just under half a million dollars for those 12 lots. And the, the last guy who held out, who was really the smart one, he got $150,000 of that money just for his own house because at that point, the grading had taken place such that he was down in this man-made canyon with the walls from the grading up like 20 feet above uh, the ridge pole of his house. He was down in this man-made canyon. He held out. He got the most money. As soon as he was gone, the graders came in, and I think that house is still buried under the parking terrace. <laughs> uh, you can dig down if you really want to. Um, so uh, this really, uh, it, it slowed down the process. Uh, Councilman Holland uh, was still fighting every step of the way. Uh, the Council had a rule at that point that if a new item came to the top of the agenda, it had to be unanimously approved or it was automatically delayed two weeks. Well, John Holland lost one awful lot of 14 to 1 votes over two or three years. And so everything that came up about the Dodgers came to the city council is delayed two weeks all the way through. And he's the one who's kind of harping on the mid-level people in the city bureaucracy such that they're very careful about crossing their T's and dotting their I's, such that we get the road uh, across the stadium property. But the issue on which the, the city really, uh, I think, hurt the Dodgers uh, would come to the fore in the spring of 1959, and this is, this is the picture I was talking about. This is a woman named Aurora Vargas. She is the daughter-in-law of a family known as Avichita who lived up in the Chavez Ravine area. And this is a shot of sheriff's deputies forcibly removing her from her house, uh, taking her away. This was widely shown around Los Angeles uh, at the time, uh, and it was subsequently followed up by pictures like this of people taking all their household goods out of their house, and eventually houses in Chavez Ravine being wrecked, and torn down, and the thought was that this was this was what was going to happen. This is what the, the uh, this is what was going to lead to the stadium. But I mean, it's very easy to look back and know that there was a community in Chavez Ravine uh, in the late '40s and early '50s that that community is gone, and that Dodger Stadium sits in its place. And to think that there is immediate and a direct connection between the two, and it's just not so. This is a picture of Chavez Ravine in 1949. Okay, there's a young photographer named Don Normark. He was about 20, 21 at the time, and really trying to learn his profession. And he went up into the hills there to take pictures of the Chavez Ravine area. They were published about 10 years ago in a very, very nice book called Chavez Ravine 1949. Um, as you can see, this picture, I believe, was taken from this knob of land, which you can 
can see down in the corner, I believe, is the land that is bracing up the third base stands of Dodger State. Okay, and you're looking northeast towards the hills, mountains behind Glendale and Burbank, uh, Elysian Park up here, the city reservoir that still exists on the flat top of that hill. Um, so this is this is what the community looked like. There were it was uh, felt that there were 1,100 homes, perhaps five or six thousand people who lived in that community, um, and it was a it was an interesting community. Parts of it looked extremely rural. It was definitely a poor community. It was overwhelmingly Mexican American. Uh, some streets were not paved. Uh, utilities could be haphazard, and the elites of the city of Los Angeles were inclined to refer to it as a slum. Uh, they saw poor Mexican-American people up there, and so immediately they translated that to mean that it was a slum, and something, something needed to be done, okay? Now, the people who lived there had a different view of it. The community revolved around a couple of institutions. On the left is Palo Verde uh, Elementary School, and on the right was the local Catholic parish, and they were both kind of the community centers for the area. People who lived there liked it. It was a place where they, where their children could play in the streets, where they felt safe about that, where the older generation was available to look after the kids. Uh, they didn't worry about crime. Uh, and as you can see in the upper left, uh, it was very near to the, to the jobs of downtown Los Angeles. Poking through that official 1949 smog, you can see uh, <laughs> the top of City Hall, which at that point, and for many years afterward, was the tallest building in the city. Um, but, uh, as I said, the, the elites didn't like it, and the, and the liberal elites, who thought they had the best interests of the community at heart, had uh, become interested in public housing. This was something that was kind of sweeping the country at the time. They thought that the solution to the, uh, to the poverty, to the potential for disease, for the existence of crime, in poor neighborhoods was to put people into public housing. This is a battle that had been fought over for a couple of decades. And in July of 1949, Congress passed the first public housing bill, a billion dollars to be spread around the country to build public housing. Uh, liberal elements in the city of Los Angeles quickly moved. There was a group called the Housing uh, Authority of the City of Los Angeles. They got 110 million of these dollars uh, to build 10,000 units in Los Angeles. Uh, the Housing Authority hired an internationally renowned architect named Richard Neutra, who you can see right here on the cover of Time Magazine. He and his subordinates went walking up in the hills of the, of the Chavez Ravine area and came to the same conclusion that the residents had, that this was a, a successful, viable community, albeit poor, and so he vowed that he and his assistants who were working on this were going to have to use their architecture uh, to build the same kind of community connections that already existed, even though all the homes were going to be torn down uh, and all of these people were being promised a place in the public housing that was going to be built to take its place. So, uh, needless to say, this led to certain protests. This is a combination of the residents who lived up in the area and some of the landlords who rented out houses in the area. They did, didn't like what was happening up there and they protested. This didn't gain a whole lot of attraction until they brought in some of the heavy hitters who didn't agree with them exactly, but were willing to protest public housing. You had the Southern California Builders Association who didn't want the competition uh, with the private sector housing that they were building. They didn't want public housing to come in and compete with them. Uh, the Times, uh, the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, we're very concerned with the, the image of Los Angeles and what it would mean around, uh, around the city, or sorry, around the country. And of course, it was tied up in the, in the national politics of the time. Here's our old friend, uh, John Holland, uh, protesting that this was communistic and uh, that we just couldn't have any uh, public housing at all. Um, so uh, this, this gains a lot of traction. And in December of 1951, barely a year after the city signs the contract with the Housing Authority, the City Council abrogates the contract. The Housing Authority immediately sues, and uh, six months later, the, sorry, four months later, in April of 1952, the State Supreme Court says, uh-uh, 
this is a valid contract, it's enforceable, the city, you have to go through with it even though you don't want to. And by the way, I know you guys have a referendum on the June ballot asking people what they think of public housing, and it doesn't matter how people vote, this contract has to stand. Well, the ballots had already been printed, the ballots went out, and 59% of the voters that June said they didn't want public housing in Los Angeles. So politicians can read a number. Um, then, that fall, you have to remember, just as with that quote from Councilman Holland, this is in the middle of the McCarthyite era in national politics. And people were very, very concerned and upset uh, with the specter of, which was always called of communism. Um, and uh, Senator McCarthy and others were, were flailing at that uh, regularly. That was mostly done through a group called the House Un-American Activities Committee in Washington. In Sacramento, we had the State Senate Committee on Un-American un Activities. And after getting some tips, they called in some of the top management of the housing authority of the city of Los Angeles, including Frank Wilkinson, who kind of ran things on a daily basis, and a couple of his top subordinates. And they got Frank on the witness stand and asked him the question of the era. Are you now? or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And Frank Wilkinson took the Fifth Amendment. Okay, and in the political dialogue of the time, that meant he was a commie pickup, and everybody knew that. Um, as a matter of fact, Wilkinson would admit sometime later, that back in the 30s briefly, he had been a member of the Communist Party. But for the people who were opposed to public housing, they now had two giant strikes on this project. They had communist influence, a hugely bad thing, uh, at the Housing Authority, and they had the vote of the public, 59% of the people of whom didn't want any public housing to take place. So their next step is to try and gain the mayorality of Los Angeles. The mayor at that time was Fletcher Bowron, who'd been the mayor since 1938. He was a liberal Republican at the time when that actually existed. <laughs> um, and the, uh, he was gonna run for re-election. Uh, so the, the LA Times and the big players went back to Washington to a congressman named Norris Polson and asked him to run for mayor of Los Angeles. He, he was a congressman from LA. And Polson said, well, gosh, guys, I really don't know anything about the hot issues in LA politics at the moment except public housing, and I'm against it. And they said, yes. <laughs> uh, so Polson came back to LA, ran against Bowen, and won. He got 53% of the vote. So with that, the city um, Polson and his, uh, the people who were working with him could go back uh, to Washington. They could connect with Republican Senator Bill Noland, who was actually from Northern California, and Vice President Nixon of Whittier College, who, uh, and they were two of the most powerful Republicans with California collection in Washington. And since the Housing Authority had bought the land with federal money, they were basically able to recapture the land for the federal government and then turn it over to the city of Los Angeles, effectively ending uh, the public housing uh, project in Los Angeles. Now, this is by the end of 1953. And until that point, we, actually this, the transaction to getting it back to the city takes place in 1954. But by the end of 1953, the housing authority had basically destroyed Chavez Ravine's community. There had been, as I said, 1,100 houses in that community as of 1949-50. There were now 20. All the others had been bought up, torn down, uh, and the remains of the houses pushed away. So it was gone. And at that point, Walter O'Malley was still trying to get the city of New York to help him build a stadium in New York City. This is a rather blurry picture, but um, and this is the Chavez Ravine neighborhood, which you last saw full of houses and streets and all this kind of thing. This is how it looked before the construction of Dodger Stadium began, but after the Housing Authority had got done with its work. This is the current site of the stadium. It's built into, they started with this kind of little gully and expanded it to back the stadium into the hills. This is the reservoir that I mentioned, uh, Police Academy, and a few of the remaining houses, you can see scattered here, a couple up here. One of those is the Artichinas. Um, so, this is what the, the area looked like in 1954 and 1955, when the city is struggling uh, now to figure out what to do with this land now that they control it. And thus, when they don't follow through, they don't uh, go 
ahead and finish the job started by the housing authority. A few of these people, like the other chiefs, are left in Chavez Ravine so that when they, they are being directly removed to make way for Dodger Stadium, but that makes it look like the entire community had to be destroyed to make way for Dodger Stadium. It was destroyed to make way for public housing. Dodger Stadium got the benefit of that, but it wasn't at, you know, directly for their benefit. So, I thank you for all that, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. On your Three drinking fountains in Dodger Stadium were open. There was one in the Dodger dugout, there was one in the visiting dugout, and there was one in Walter O'Malley's office. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't quite serve the needs of everybody who wanted to get a drink of water. O'Malley later claimed that, um, you might, those of you who are old enough who went to the stadium when it first opened, remember how everything was color-coded, every deck had a different color and all of that kind of thing. Well, he had gone out and bought color-coded paper cups, and they were different colors for every level of the stadium, and they were staffed in the bathrooms. And they thought that rather than building drinking fountains, people could go in and just get, get some water at the tap. Well, when the health department heard that, they said, no, 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 no. There have to be, they, you know, you can't have people drinking from water that's in the bathroom. You have to have separate, and, and they went ahead and did that. Now, exactly how believable that story is, I'll leave to your judgment, but that was, that was the story about what, and the cups were there. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Rick is a larger and more complicated story. Um, there were three, it was a three-man partnership that basically controlled the team. There was O'Malley, there was Ricky, and there was a guy named John L. Smith, who, despite his rather nondescript name, was at that point the president and chairman of the board of Pfizer. And he was an immensely rich man because during World War II, Pfizer was the first company that figured out how to mass produce penicillin. And they had made a ton of money doing that and it saved a, a ton of American lives by having penicillin uh, available to the troops by the end of the war. It was at times an uneasy alliance. If you go back, it so happens that the, the minutes from the Dodgers Board of Directors meetings have all been preserved in Ricky's papers at the Library of Congress. And I, I went through them quite closely. Um, and it's interesting to look at the meetings and see what people talk about. Ricky is always talking about, uh, we have these great kids coming up through the minor leagues, they're gonna be wonderful players, uh, we're training them, we've gotta have more scouts and all this. O'Malley is always saying, Evans is falling apart, we need to start making plans to replace it and get a brand new stadium. And John Smith is always talking about, boy, we're wasting a lot of money here. Uh, <laughs> You may remember that Ricky had a nickname that was El Chifo. <laughs> and he, that had been hung on him by the New York sports writers uh, during World War II. Uh, Ricky had come to the team, and Ricky was a great believer in young players and speed. And the Dodger team at that old was, at that point, was old and full of sluggers. And Ricky began to get rid of Dolph Millie and Billy Herman and players like that. And supposedly the, the, the reporter said, that was because he was getting a percentage of the profit, and by trading off these high salary players, he'd get more money. So they gave him the nickname El Chipo. But there's a very revealing interview uh, about 1947 with one of the New York papers interviewing John L. Smith. And the reporter says to him, well, what about this stuff with Ricky being so cheap? And John Smith says, cheap? I think the guy's extravagant. You know, we're just wasting too much money. <laughs> um, and the way the partnership was set up, it was very interesting. God, this, this is going to be a long story. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, basically, although the three men each owned 25% of the team, they voted together so that their 75% of the stock could outweigh the other quarter of the stock. And what that meant was when Ricky and O'Malley got in an argument, whoever could gain the support of John L. Smith won and controlled the team. Okay, and it became a series of um, decisions that were made about the structure of the team. And the straw that evidently broke the camel's back was Ricky's decision, which Smith and O'Malley said, we don't think this is a good idea, but you're the president, you go ahead and do it. And that was to get involved in what was called the American Football Conference. Uh, and the conference was active right after World War II, but eventually failed. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers came from there into the NFL, the Cleveland Browns. Um, 
But the, the Dodger venture, which was called the Brooklyn Football Dodgers, uh, failed. And in the last year, it lost $750,000, which was more than the profit the Dodgers made in a normal year. And with that, O'Malley had Smith's full support. Ricky saw the writing on the wall, and Ricky decided to get out. So th th there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of sharp maneuvering by both O'Malley and Ricky. But O'Malley didn't really force him out. It's, it's quite more nuanced than that. Uh, I tell you to read the book, but I, we can talk after. Is <laughs> it leaving the team? Oh, yeah. Um, I had two very long and productive interviews with Buzzy, who was, who was extremely helpful. Um, Buzzy wanted to operate and perhaps own his own team. And he looked around at the Dodgers. He's got O'Malley owning the team. He's got Peter coming along. And so he can just look at it and know he's never going to be able to operate or own the Dodgers. An O'Malley family member is going to do that. So he goes to O'Malley, and they talk the situation over. And O'Malley, who of course was a huge power in baseball at the time, this is like 1968, OK? And they know they're going to expand in 1969. So O'Malley says to Buzzy, you go around, and you look at all of the uh, expansion groups in the various cities. You find the one you like, and I'll make sure they get a franchise. So Buzzy went and he decided that San Diego was the best deal and they were going to give him, they were going to make him president of the team, they were going to give him a piece of ownership. And so he went off to there. But it, it was, I mean, there, there were, like I said, there was pushing and shoving between the two of them. There was no doubt about that. But basically, Buzzy made a decision on his own for his future. Thank you. Yeah. In your book, do you cover some of the shenanigans that Mayor Paulson pulled streaks? Mike Lott illegal to get the Dodgers here? Um, I don't know that he did anything illegal. <laughs> I mean, I, I have an article where he admits that he did a lot of, you know, illegal activity to get the Dodgers here. Well, he made a lot of promises uh, that he couldn't he couldn't follow through on. I'll give him that. They went, the, the, the whole thing was kind of triggered in very early 1957 when the Dodgers bought the Los Angeles Angels of the Pacific Coast League. And that gave them the territorial rights to Los Angeles. And that was just like this huge fire bell ringing that the Dodgers were thinking of moving to Los Angeles. Immediately, the city and the county put together a delegation that goes to Vero Beach. And uh, Polson is one of the leaders. Ernie Hahn from the, from the county supervisors is another one. And they get in this meeting with O'Malley. And they don't know from baseball management, right? And O'Malley's been around the block several times. So they basically said, what do we need to do to get you here? And O'Malley throws out some ideas. And they say, well, we can do that. So O'Malley throws out another idea. And they say, oh, we can do that, too. <laughs> and and um, this goes on for quite a while. And they promised him the moon and green cheese and Jupiter and all the stuff. <laughs> and then they go back to LA, and they sit down with the city attorney and the county attorney. And those guys say to him, oh, you know, Mr. Mayor, you really, really can't do that. That isn't legal. Uh, but uh, Polson was just trying to get the team there. I mean, he was just, there's a great, great quote about Polson from Jim Murray, the, the old columnist with the LA Times, who said, uh, Norris Polson was the kind of guy who always seemed to be having an enormously good time without quite understanding what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah, Polson might have done something illegal, but he probably didn't know it was illegal at the time. He learned later. For now, okay. let's get one more question, one more. Okay. and then yeah. we'll open it up at the end. Yeah. I know how much you know about the Dodgers of baseball. After, after all the research, do you have a favorite thing that you learned that you didn't know? Wait. Yeah, I, I guess it was in, in broad terms what I learned tonight. When I started the book, I was very aware of all of the troubles that he had in New York getting out. And even though I had you know, I've been reading the LA Times sports page every day during the years I'm talking about here. I had no memory. I had no conception of what was going on. I mean, I knew about Drysdale and Wills and, and all of those guys. But all of the stuff that was going on in city councils, I had no clue about it whatsoever. And I didn't realize that all of this stuff. I mean, I was, I was nine when they moved here, 13 when Dodger Stadium opened. It just wasn't part of what I was conscious of. Um, so learning about all of that was a big, a big revelation to me. So 
So, give it away. We'll, we'll have more questions at the end.